Elon Musk has put the bulls on the cryptocurrency market in a bit of a fix. Just earlier this week, he announced that Tesla would be no longer accepting cryptocurrency payments, or rather Bitcoin payments, not cryptocurrency, rather Bitcoin payments for electrical cars. His mere tweet plunged the Bitcoin market by 15% before it could recover. So it went from a little over $54,000 to little less than $46,000 or in its neighborhood. Interestingly, this announcement came just three months after Tesla announced that it was going to accept Bitcoin payments and it sent the cryptocurrency soaring by 16%. But now, Elon Musk has cited the environmental cost which is involved in the mining and the transactions and the entire power consumption. Citing that as a reason, he said that the company will, long, will no longer be accepting Bitcoin. Now, has Musk dropped his Bitcoin holdings? No, he has not. Has he said he's totally against cryptocurrency? No, he's not. He's actually said in a statement that he put on Twitter that they would be happy to consider cryptocurrencies that utilize less than 1% of the energy that is used for Bitcoin transactions. So let's look at the numbers because when it comes to Bitcoins, this is the first aspect I really want to get to. When it comes to Bitcoins, we are more interested about how the central banks will respond, how the monetary policy will work out. Will there be illegal payments, you know, terrorist activities, illegal activities? But we always skip over the environmental cost and we'll do some imagination. Some imagination with the numbers would be warranted. By 2017, the entire Bitcoin network was using as much power as the next 500 fastest supercomputers on Earth. Rather more. By 2017, I'll have to correct myself here, by 2017, the entire Bitcoin network, the power consumption it had, the computing power it had, was 100,000 times greater than the 500 fastest supercomputers on Earth. I'll repeat this for clarity because it's a mind-boggling number. Imagine 500 fastest supercomputers on Earth in terms of computing power. Here you have the Bitcoin number, which is 100,000 times greater in terms of computing power. By 2017, this was the staggering power of the entire Bitcoin network. Now, if you move on, by 2017 in Venezuela, there was great amount of hyperinflation. The state was plunged into a hyperinflation after its oil crisis. And that is why the state had to subsidize the electricity. And that is where it became interesting. Because now the state was a place for cheap electricity and it became a hub for Bitcoin mining operations. So much that it used to cause power outages across the country often and the authorities had to take action against those who were mining Bitcoin. In China, people also sourced free energy from the large dams and all those other carbon neutral sources available. And the Xinjiang province, which is home to the Uyghur Muslim minorities, where the Chinese have been on a very violent campaign, that has also become a hotbed to the Bitcoin mining and other transactional operations. Now, if you go by the numbers also, if you go by the numbers from the Bitcoin Energy Consumption Index, the annual estimated Bitcoin network, the power consumption, it went from 9.5 terawatts uh, uh, per hour per year, 9.5 terawatts per hour per year, to somewhere around 115.846 terawatt per hour per year in 2021. So from 9.5 terawatt per hour per year, 115.8 terawatt per hour per year in 2021. That has been the increase. Now, if someone asks you what's, what's really a terawatt, I mean, it's a, it's a new term. So a terawatt is basically equivalent to 1 trillion watt per hour. So 1 terawatt per hour is actually 1 trillion watts per hour. That is the amount of annual estimate of power consumption of the Bitcoin network. Talk about the environmental costs. We also have to talk about the annual energy consumption of Bitcoin in relative to some countries, just to get an idea. So the power consumption of Bitcoin network is great, but how do I imagine it? Think how much power consumption is done by Pakistan or Netherlands annually. That's how much the Bitcoin network uses. This shouldn't give Imran Khan any ideas, but that's how much power consumption the Bitcoin network warrants, which includes the transaction, the mining, and all those things. In terms of relativity to country, it's 46.9% of the energy that is used in Australia. So 46.9% of Australia's energy can directly come from the Bitcoin network. For Italy, it's 36.8%. For United Kingdom, it's 35.6%. For France, it's 24.2%. For Germany, it's 20.5%. If I look at Canada, it's 20.3%. It's 11.6% of the total energy used in Russia 
and merely 2.7% of the total energy used in the United States of America. So tomorrow, if the US falls short of 3% of its power, annual power consumption, it's missing out somewhere, the Bitcoin network is the place they can turn to. But this is for now. These numbers hold true for now. What happens in the future? Because all of us are very excited about Bitcoin being the actual mode of transaction. We all want to get rid of the dollar. We all want to get rid of the rupee, the pound, the yen and all those things. And everyone talks about Bitcoin as it's going to be the future, which personally, in my opinion, is a very laughable prospect. But nevertheless, let's hypothetically assume that the Bitcoin network was to use was to be used to make 1 billion credit card transactions like we do on Visa and MasterCard. 1 billion credit card transactions. That's not a huge number. Even if we go by, say, uh, 500 million people owning credit cards, which is not a huge number, again, given the population in China, Europe, USA, and even India. The Indian number would be a little low, but you know you can get an idea. Even with 500 million people own two credit cards, 1 billion credit card transactions, say, over a period of 10 days, 20 days, is not a lot. So what kind of power consumption, energy consumption for Bitcoin are we talking about here for the Bitcoin network? Turns out that would be 14 times the power consumption globally. So if the Bitcoin network is to be used for 1 billion credit card transactions, it could be a period of any number of days. It could be in two days, it could be in 20 days. That's not relevant. But the amount of energy that would be required to facilitate 1 billion credit card transactions over the Bitcoin network would be 14 times the global consumption of power. Now, that would have been a great idea if our planet was as big as Jupiter, which is 11 times the size of Earth, and we were a very established civilization across the planet. But that's not how the Earth really works. So where does the Bitcoin network intend to get this power consumption? And surely, it won't stop at 1 billion transactions. What it goes to 3 billion tomorrow, 5 billion tomorrow. Can the Bitcoin network keep up? That's the first question. The second question is, what it does to Bitcoin now? Because Elon Musk has said they would be exploring other cryptocurrencies. Now, Bitcoin constitutes 46% of the total Bitcoin uh, cryptocurrency market, 46% of it. And its market cap is more than 1 trillion, followed by Ethereum, which is just $400 billion right now. So it has a shareholding of $1 trillion. So what does it mean right now? for Bitcoin, for the investments in Bitcoin, now that the environmental debate has been triggered and we have Democrats in the White House who are very pro-environment causes and all those kind of things. First thing is, when you invest in Bitcoin, you're not looking to go on full Monty. You're investing 5 to 10% of your savings or 5 to 10% of your portfolio. That's what all the stakeholders and what of the observers say. I remember just being on a call with one of the biggest investors globally and they said that they do not have the best ideas when it comes to Bitcoin. But if anyone is so enthusiastic, their portfolio shouldn't extend to more than 10% when it comes to cryptocurrencies, specifically Bitcoin, because everyone wants to, you know, go for the Bitcoin first. But let's talk about the volatility also. Now, this is a volatile market. This is even from an investment point of view. Let's just talk of it as a commodity. Let's not talk about it as, say, a currency that is looking to replace the dollar. It's a very volatile market. Now, my problem with it is like Elon Musk, he might be a majority stakeholder in this currency. Tomorrow, it could be Bill Gates, who's expressed both uh, pro and cons about the Bitcoin network. Tomorrow, what if one of the majority stakeholder or one very influential person triggers a downfall in the value of Bitcoins or any cryptocurrency for that matter. How do we handle that situation? Because when it comes to the volatility of currencies managed by the country's central banks, there is a margin. You understand that the rupee can fluctuate against the dollar. That's very normal. You can understand it'll go up, it'll go down. But you do not expect a margin of 20% or 15% because someone made a tweet. That's about the problem here. How can you depend on a currency this volatile? And perhaps that is the reason that the central banks are also coming up with their digital currencies across the world. China has already rolled out beta testing for a significant amount of its population. Bank of England came up with the proposal first. If I talk about the central banks, they were of Canada, Uruguay, Thailand, Venezuela, Sweden, Singapore, and even Russia, which have considered the idea of a digital currency, which won't be a cryptocurrency. It will be using the blockchain method, yes, but it won't be a cryptocurrency. It would be backed by the state. That's very different than being backed by private players. Even India is considering the use of a digital currency. The RBI has been vocal about it. So what does it leave for Bitcoin from here? I mean, it's gone from what? $0.08 on July 19th, 2010 
to more than $54,000 on May 12th before Elon Musk made his infamous tweet, as many would like to call it. Where does it leave the bulls and the bears? Well, for one matter, the bears have got a lot of ammunition from us to it because now they can talk about the environmental cost, they can talk about the risk, they can talk about the volatility and things like that. But the bulls, they would continue to gamble in it because there are a lot of backers still in this game. The people who are looking to back include some very heavyweights from the Wall Street, including Jamie Dimon from JP Morgan, Lloyd Blankfein from Goldman Sachs. So these kind of people are actually backing the Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies there. So a lot of bulls would be very much interested and they would like to continue the gamble, just that with an added twist offered by Elon Musk. The future of Bitcoin is interesting, but at what point we'll stop and consider the environmental cost to it is something we all have to just wait and watch as the market unfolds, as the gamble unfolds. Thank you.